it's great to have Dave back these years later, once again, uh, addressing the music of Led Zeppelin, but from another angle. So as you can see, Dave's going to talk about what remains after the song, Led Zeppelin Incorporated. So let's give him a big River Campus welcome. Well, thanks very much for that introduction, John. I've got to say, you look a lot older, but I don't think I do. Anyway, uh, thanks very much for coming tonight, everybody. I really appreciate it. So, when does a rock band change from a living, breathing, writing, recording, and touring group into the band incorporated? That's a corporate, sorry, the band incorporated is a corporate entity. Such musical corporations market their brands in four ways. First, the memory of the band is kept alive and turned into legend, with first-person recollections of the history and formative years, and new factoids reveal about influences on the origins of songs and albums. Reverent video documentaries are produced, interspersing talking heads with grainy footage of early appearance of the band members leading up to the latest exploits, including the obligatory induction ceremony into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame in Cleveland. Second, the corporation ensures that the music is continuously rolled out in a stream that includes reissues and re-releases from the archives and recastings of the hits in new formats with new delivery systems, wherein original albums and scratchy bootlegs become sonically pristine discs and files available for purchase in multiple box set versions and on websites. Third, the publicity machine that keeps the fan base stoked by annual conventions and festivals and rumors of possible reunions until everyone involved is dead and sometimes even after. Co cover bands substitute, lovingly recreating the original band's live concert experience down to every effects pedal and inch of hair. And fourth, the corporation encourages critical reevaluation or indeed wholesale rethinking of the band's legacy, influence, and place in rock history in booklets and well-placed stories in magazines such as Rolling Stone, based on new research and added context to existing interpretations. As is clear from the power of the corporate edifices representing bands, particularly from the classic rock era of the 60s and 70s, we now no longer let these bands die. Zombie-like, they wander in our collective playlists and Facebook pages, in ever new formats motivating armies of lawyers to negotiate with iTunes and Pandora and other internet entities. They ceaselessly remind us of the glory days of yore, as the band's accomplishments are debated in the media and the members are wheeled onto the stages of award shows to crank through the hits one more time and bestow their munificence on the latest generation of would-be rock stars. The old question of whether recording is live or Memorex, which only us old timers will remember, gains new meaning in this context. It will be difficult, even in the best of circumstances, to determine if and when guitarist Keith Richards is actually dead. <laughs> and with the Rolling Stones promotional machine behind him, we may never know. So-called live albums, of the so-called live albums of the Stones may continue indefinitely. The Beatles are, of course, the poster band for classic rock immortality, with an unstoppable media machine that grows past the legend, past Mount Olympus to the stars of the Cirque du Soleil and beyond. It is unthinkable for Ringo and Paul not to end their concert evenings and award show appearances with a little help from my friends and Hey Jude. They are Beatles forever, along with their deceased but not forgotten bandmates, and even the fifth Beatle, and power behind the throne, George Martin. But not all bands are universally admired as the Beatles. The band we'll focus on today, Led Zeppelin, has a somewhat checkered history by comparison. As part of the third wave of the British invasion after the initial rock and roll band era of the early Beatles, The Who, and The Rolling Stones, and the subsequent era of the blues rock virtuosic heights scaled by Hendrix, Clapton, and Beck, and supergroups like Cream, Led Zeppelin was held to a different standard. No longer could white British bands innocently make millions playing the blues. Critics now knew about American blues masters Muddy Waters, Willie Dixon, and Howlin' Wolf, and many others documented by scholars such as Paul Oliver. And the emerging style of heavy metal and accompanying practice of trashing hotel rooms was not universally appreciated, even as Led Zeppelin brought it into existence. Musically, Led Zeppelin was a band founded not on melody and harmony and recognizable popular song forms. But following the Chicago electric blues style, the music was based on timbre and texture, the repeated riff, and new to rock music, a pounding and relentless straight eighth rhythm where metric conflict 
and syncopation replace swing and beat fluidity. The extent to which Led Zeppelin was actually a stylistically diverse, sophisticated studio-based band is clouded by their live shows, which were gargantuan and overblown, as the band perfected the proverbial stadium rock spectacle of sound and light, including long, often, often uneven jams. Led Zeppelin was enormously successful with their fans, who worshipped at the Stadia Houses of the Holy, as the band called them. But Zeppelin was initially rejected by critics, who found them pretentious, unoriginal to the point of outright thievery, and outdated from the outset. How this story has been changed by corporate interests is the topic for today. Led Zeppelin and the band spanned 1968 to 80, punctuated at the outset by the death of the blues to rock band the Yardbirds and the birth of the new Yardbirds, the original name for Zeppelin, in a version of Spinal Tap's reference to the originals and the new originals. <laughs> the band was punctuated at its end by the death of one of the original members, drummer John Bonham, in the iconic manner of drowning in his own vomit after an epic drinking binge. The band's 12-year span of time highs, however, turned out to be just the first phase of the phenomenon which is now unquestionably Led Zeppelin, Inc., a corporation characterized by the four features just described, recollections, reissues, reunion rumors, and reevaluations. Indeed, like a colossus, the band continues to shape the musical landscape. They are a staple of classical rock stations. They are featured in commercials for Cadillac cars. They continually inspire aspiring musicians, motivate court cases for plagiarism, receive accolades and awards such as the 2012 Kennedy Center Honors, and in general act as a bellwether for the golden olden days when a band would stick around for longer than a teenage generation and albums were bought at record stores and prized for their art, music, message, and lineage. In the great tradition of Beethoven and Mahler before them, Led Zeppelin put out nine symphonies in their studio albums. Along with the soundtrack to the movie, the song remains the same. These have been followed by a stream of new and slightly used recordings, including a 1994 CD box set, a two-disc set of early BBC recordings, the triple live release strangely entitled How the West Was Won, from 2003 documenting live performances in 1972, a greatest hits double collection, and a new, new recasting of the albums to match current technologies. The LedZeppelin.com website lists the following for sale. Remastered audio remastered original vinyl, deluxe edition remastered vinyl, remastered original CD, deluxe edition CD, super deluxe edition box, and as of June 3rd of this year, the aforementioned new versions with the first three albums newly remastered with an additional disc of previously unreleased songs in companion audio. Led Zeppelin Inc. is working overtime to remind us that what remains after the song is a new, improved, and must-have version of that song. It was 20 years ago today, way back in 1994, that I was working on an article entitled, Does the Song Remain the Same? Questions of Authorship and Identification in the Music of Led Zeppelin. I was interested at that time, and remain interested today, in how listeners identify the entity that is Led Zeppelin. While songs like Dazed and Confused and Whole Lot of Love were and continue to be iconic and strongly associated with the band, it is shocking to realize that Led Zeppelin was not the author of these songs in a strict sense. Is this the case with the Beatles, the Stones, Cream, the Animals, and other bands of the London, Liverpool, and Manchester stations in the British music, British music scene of the 1960s? The members of Led Zeppelin began their careers in cover bands. Although differently in the unusual story, guitarist Jimmy Page and bassist John Paul Jones were studio musicians. In Led Zeppelin's case, this experience seemed to have only enhanced the amount of musical borrowing. Even the fabled Stairway to Heaven, the best-known song of the era off the fourth album, starts from another song as is currently the topic of a court case brought by the family of a member of the band Spirit in regard to the song Taurus. Let's listen to the, Taurus, the Spirit song Taurus and Stairway back to back.
Let's now listen to another example. We're going to compare the Fleetwood Mac song, Oh Well, with Black Dog by Zeppelin, also from the fourth album. So we'll start off with Fleetwood Mac playing Oh Well, and then Black Dog. Okay, in my earlier article, I borrowed a distinction made by music writer Arlen, Arnold Shaw's book on 1950s popular music, one that distinguished covers from reworkings. Led Zeppelin's version of I Can't Quit You Baby from the first album is a cover in this context. It is clearly a version of an existing song, in this case by Chicago bluesman Willie Dixon. Whole Lot of Love, on the other hand, from the second album is a reworking of the song You Need Love, again by Dixon recorded originally by Muddy Waters, which inspires the musical and lyrical aspects of its reworked version, but is augmented expertly by the formal, timbral, and improvisatory sounding recording techniques and formal elements so characteristic of Led Zeppelin. Legally, the band had to play, pay the Dixon estate, but musically, they created an identity. The Led Zeppelin covers place them in the blues rock lineage of British rock of the 1960s, but their reworkings mark them as a new voice, innovative and creative in a context totally misunderstood at the time, and brand them with an unmistakable identity that listeners readily identify with. Not a cover band, then, so much as a reworking band. At least that was my argument 20 years ago. I want to go beyond my earlier work today to consider the legacy of Led Zeppelin as manifest in Led Zeppelin, Inc., which includes the question of authorship and identity, drawing from the four categories mentioned in my introduction, which, as you recall, I literally refer to as recollections, reissues, reunion rumors, and reevaluations. A detailed examination of the four would be prohibitively long, however, and so in the interest of time and your goodwill, I will focus on the reevaluation and merely mention the remainder. Let us start with reunions. It is often said that the key to immortality is to live fast, die young, and leave a great sounding corpus of work. In Lev Zeppelin's case, the death of drummer Bonham at age 32 in 1980 has not prevented the band from reuniting on several occasions. In 1985, at Live Aid with drummer Phil Collins. In 1994 and 1998, Plant and Page played together in Marrakesh and put out two albums as the Honey Drippers. In 1995, Led Zeppelin played a brief set when inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. And the official reunion concert occurred on December 10th, 2007, at London's O2 Arena with Jason, the son of Bonham, on drums. The latter was distributed in video and CD and was to turn into a tour, but singer Robert Plant was uncooperative. He rekindled his roots and found success with Alison Krauss and in his earlier band of joy, leaving his compatriots to flounder, especially Page, who has never escaped the Led Zeppelin vortex. It is hard to see another reunion at present given the acrimony on display in recent exchanges between Page and Plant. As the Eagles have demonstrated time and time again, however, no amount of bad blood can stop final reunion tours when the money is right. We will also dispense quickly with historical recollections as the story is still being told and the truth, as it were, is usually not available until all the people concerned are dead and their papers and lives are opened up completely. YouTube videos certainly give us insight in multiple interviews and early performances, video bootlegs, and so on, but we will not go further here. And I've mentioned the releases and reissues, which are a fascinating topic and one with the continuing shelf life, but let's move on. So now let's consider reevaluation the true topic of this paper. But rather than delving into issues such as gender and sexuality, musical cultural appropriation, ritual and spiritual significance, such as those addressed by Susan Fast in her excellent book on Led Zeppelin, I will, as I did in 1994, stick to the music. The songs, particularly from the first four albums, are so ingrained in our consciousness now it is instructive to read Led Zeppelin's initial bad reviews. It's hard to imagine they initially got bad reviews. At Rolling Stone, the music critic John Mendelssohn was still a student at UCLA when he wrote his infamous scathing reviews of the first two Led Zeppelin albums, before going on to a somewhat notable writing career interspersed with entirely forgettable attempts at a music career. The sting of these reviews lives on in Page's mind, and he responds to them even in recent interviews. Mendelssohn wrote sarcastically and condescendingly about Led Zeppelin, 
caricaturing the white boy singing the blues ethos, the guitar hero mentality, and the drug-tinged, drooling fanboy responses to the style of the band. He might well have titled his reviews, They're Only In It For The Money and Groupies, One and Two. Critics man maintained this edge for years in articles on Zeppelin. The production and musicianship are grudgingly admired, but the non-attribution of authorship of their hits, the rock star vibe, and the tremendous success is criticized, as if they put one over on everybody and critics wanted to make sure the readers knew that they were in on the scam. As mentioned, Led Zeppelin was a third generation UK band, and so was unfavorably compared with the first two generations, the Beatles, Stones, and Cream, as ripping off the aesthetics of the earlier bands and being a contrived Johnny come lately to the party. Although he played on many tracks as a session player, Page was never the pure god, guitar god Clapton was in the minds of critics. Singer Plant was parodied as a prissy Percy, an oversexed showman, and Bonzo Bonham was portrayed as a drunk animal on drums. The only unassailable player was Jones, the most experienced and best musician among them, but one who became more influential on the band only in the unconvincing new directions on the later albums. Jones became the Ringo of the band, the last one called for the reunion tour, and the one with the least in-band respect. In Susan Fast's book, she notes her correspondence with Jones, where he expressed concerns that songwriting credits on the band's songs favor the riff over the arrangement, and that writing on Led Zeppelin focuses on page and plant and ignores the rhythm section, which of course included him. After their second album, Led Zeppelin became in many senses the victims of their own success, as their diversity as a band was not appreciated. The third album is the exemplar for this view. It was not understood in the context of the hits Dazed and Confused, and particularly Whole Lot of Love from the first two albums. And it was unrecognized as laying the groundwork for the great synthesis of acoustic timbres and form from growing intensity that came together on Stairway to Heaven on the fourth album. Although the sixth album, Physical Graffiti, is Led Zeppelin's double album attempt on their own label, Swan Song, and a Beatles White album, Led Zeppelin IV is the band's Sgt. Pepper, the best album they're best known for. The diversity here harkens back to their first album, where nine songs range from two to almost seven minutes. Typically, only two songs are attributed outside the band, but there's no mention of Jake Holmes, the source of Dazed and Confused, this is a piece Page actually also played with the Yardbirds, complete with violin, bow, and his guitar. And the song, Babe, I'm Gonna Leave You, attributed as traditional, instead of by author Annie Bredden or performer Joan Baez. The setting is, however, the first acoustic light to heavy song and anticipates the third album in Stairway to Heaven. Its pair, Black Mountain Side, is modeled after Bert Yant and is an instrumental acoustic guitar track with tabla drums, anticipating the world music aspects of Kashmir. You Shook Me and I Can't Quit You Baby are part of the Chicago Electric Blues legacy that characterizes the British rock scene in London, also represented by the riff-based How Many More Times. While the first two are attributed, the last is not. The final track on the first side, Dazed and Confused, is the first quintessential Zeppelin song, at the same time most closely associated with the band, but a classic reworking, sonically brilliant, formally diverse, and blues-tinged. Communication Breakdown is a fast power rock blast that anticipates heavy metal, Boring from Eddie Cochran's nervous breakdown. The pattern for many albums to come was set in this inaugural effort. The reevaluation re that has come under the auspices of Led Zeppelin Inc. may be dramatized in the following two views, which I've synthesized from multiple sources, both still extant but with the latter coming to dominate the discourse. Here they are in order from early to present day. Number one. Led Zeppelin was a commercial arrangement, a boy band of skilled, but with the exception of drummer John Bonham, derivative players paired with a ruthless manager to exploit the market for rock arrangements of black American blues created by earlier generations of bands and players. The band made millions without paying royalties to the many musicians they ripped off and showed their contempt by using often the same song name while denying att attribution. The whole pretentious, spinal tap-esque atmosphere of violin bows and double and triple neck guitars and the sordid escapades of their misogynist, drunken orgies and onstage excesses started as a joke. A British lead balloon crashing and burning in a publishing company called Super Hype. The only original aspect of the group was their T-Rex style drumming, which along with the lack of rhythmic subtlety and songwriting complexity led to the primitive style of heavy metal. In their Wagnerian ethos, they exemplified the worst sins of the 1970s when the social consciousness of the 1960s combining civil rights, anti-war protest and music was co-opted by the media and the corporate smothering of youth culture. 
Subsequent punk bands ran screaming from any hint of gaseous Led Zeppelins. So that's the first view. Now here's the new view under corporate rehabilitation. In 1968, Jimmy Page and John Paul Jones, soon to combine to create Led Zeppelin, were experienced and top studio musicians in London. They helped to forge the sound for many bands and songs. In the studio, playing chops and knowledge of style and repertoire trumps originality. And this background figured prominently in Led Zeppelin. With the addition of vocalist Robert Plant, well-versed in the blues, and the original element of one of the first true rock drummers, John Bonham, Led Zeppelin set out not to be new, but to become a transformative culmination of what came before, in a bold combination of studio expertise and improvisational performance. While every blues-based musician from Robert Johnson's time learned and recast lyrics and musical figures from recordings, the radio, and personal experience, largely without attribution, Led Zeppelin's sales and success combined with the growing awareness of musical styles in history to lead to a new standard for acknowledging sources that resulted in justifiable criticism. But this does not negate their musical accomplishments. The band created the live experience of light and sound familiar to concert goers everywhere and gave birth to a multitude of diverse styles under their extraordinary influence. They rank with the great bands of classic rock. Certainly the latter view is on the rise exemplified by the fanboy excitement evident in otherwise informative articles by rock journalists in books like Heaven and Hell from 1991. That's actually at the other end of the table there. The expectations for the current round of releases even exceeds that of the previous remasterings from 1990, which is really the point at which time and its perspective, along with the nascent forces of Led Zeppelin Inc., began the band's rehabilitation. To close today, let's try to experience two musical aspects that Zeppelin does not get enough credit for. The first is musical form. Although they often take their starting point from other songs, in their reworkings, Led Zeppelin creates compelling forms to envelop and develop the source material. We're going to start with the song When the Levee Breaks, in the original version by Kansas Joe McCoy and Memphis Minnie from 1929, where they describe the floods of 1927 that overflowed the banks of the Mississippi. The song is a strict 12-bar blues, except for the point at which an apparent mistaken chord leads to an improvisatory, improvisatory instrumental break. So let's listen to that. In their reworking, Led Zeppelin creates a three-part form with contrast in texture and rhythm to buttress the structure, and irregular lengths of sections in the outer parts of the form to express the story of the unpredictable floods. The sound and form make a formidable combination. So just take a look here at the setup. So we have the drum intro, then we've got a vamp of 18 bars, and then the turnaround, some verses. You see all the irregular numbers of bars, seven and seven. And then the middle section is a little more regular, and then when the vamp and verse uh, structure comes back, it's a little bit more regular again, but then at the end, we get this irregular combination of the break, 12 bars, etc. So you can see that it's, instead of the 12 bar original, it's greatly expanded, and every section kind of has its own space and breathing power, and it has a middle section as well. So let's listen to Led Zeppelin when the levee breaks. Okay, my second musical aspect concerns the metric conflicts often found in Led Zeppelin songs, as they make a virtue from the strictness of rock rhythms compared to the swing-influenced beats of rock and roll or the funky attacks of soul. We will use the song Cashmere from the sixth album to demonstrate, with an example from John Brackett's uh, article to illustrate. So there's the lick and the drum. So notice the lick is in three, so the three rhythms in the guitar and the four rhythms in the drum. So he's got a three versus a four. The version of the song we will use comes from the Jack White documentary on guitars called It Might Get Loud. We're going to watch it once, and then we're going to actually play the drums ourselves. We have a little exercise, and then we'll watch and then we'll listen to Casimir. So let's start off just by watching a bit from that video that we're going to watch again in a minute. Oh. 
one song that uh, always kind of intrigued me was Kashmir. Where, where did that come from? Where did that, that rhythm and that feel? Well, the, the, um, it originated from playing around on a tuning that I've been using quite a bit. And um, it's called, they call it Dadgad, okay, for the, for, and it's, uh, Sounds like it's pretty similar to like a, a, a sitar yeah, tuning, yeah, yeah. actually. But um, I, I'd, um, I've been playing around on this quite a lot, and uh, it just so happened that I, there was this song that I had called Swan Song, believe it or not, and it was all these parts and intricate guitar parts, and right at the very end of it, I had this, I had this thing which went like this. <laughs> tape ends and I thought well we were doing some rehearsals well we were making an album actually with Led Zeppelin and um, John Bonham was there and the others I don't know where they they were they weren't actually at the house this is at Headley Grange and I said I've got this riff so now I turned it round starting with the first bit first right, yeah, yeah. and he lays the uh, and he lays on the rhythm on it so it sort of goes like this wow. the guitar. One song that uh, I was kind of intrigued me was Kashmir. Where, where did that come from? Where did that, that rhythm and that feel? Well, the, the, um, it originated from playing around on a tuning that I've been using quite a bit. And um, it's called, they call it Dad Dad, okay, for the, for, and it's, uh, Sounds like it's pretty similar to like a, a, a sitar tuning yeah. actually. But, um, I, I'd, um, I've been playing around on this quite a lot, and uh, it just so happened that I, there was this song that I had called Swan Song, believe it or not, and it was all these parts and intricate guitar parts, and right at the very end of it, I had this, I had this thing which went like this. <laughs> We were doing some rehearsals. Well, we were making an album actually with Led Zeppelin. Um, John Bonham was there, and the others, I don't know where they, they were, they weren't actually at the house, it's at Headley Grange. And I said, I've got this riff. So now I turned it round, starting with the first bit first, and he lays the, uh, and he lays on the rhythm on it. So it sort of goes like this. <laughs>
There are other musical elements we could have highlighted, but the point is that Led Zeppelin, for all their sins of unoriginality and personal excesses, were a diverse band with a multitude of styles and approaches. This point is likely the most prescient from the corporate recasting of the band, from the bad boys of the lost 1970s to innovative musicians for the present and unlimited future. Led Zeppelin, Inc. Thank you. sitting around at a bar, um, Paige and Keith Moon and John Entwistle from The Who, and they were talking about getting a band together, and they sort of said, let's get, a, let's get a band together, and they said, oh, that would go over like essentially what we would call a lead balloon, but in Britain they call a lead zeppelin, and both Keith Moon and John Entwistle, the drummer and the bassist for uh, The Who, claim that they're the ones who originated the, the name Led Zeppelin, but somehow it stuck. So it's kind of a joke. It's like, this, this will go over like a lead balloon, like it'll crash and burn sort of on the first album. So it's, it's a bit of a joke, but apparently either Keith Moon or John Entwistle, depending on what source you look at, came up with the idea for a lead Zeppelin. Now originally it was L-E-A-D Zeppelin, but they wanted to be, they didn't want the lead because they thought they'd pronounce it as lead Zeppelin, so they changed it to L-E-D Zeppelin. Go ahead. Uh, in the current day and age, uh, well, a practice I hear about with well, a lot of uh, like rappers and that sort of music is what they do is they plan on just paying for when they get lawsuits for stealing people's stuff. Like that is actually a practice where a decently successful rapper will literally just sample songs without permission and just knowing in the back of their head that in the future they're going to be paying for it, but it's okay because the song will sell long enough that they can afford to pay for it. And this sort of crack, like, like that sort of reflects that in this modern day and age, music is made from sampling pre-existing music. So do you think that, that uh, in that kind of context, this kind of unoriginality is going to become like, you know, something that goes over very well as opposed to real this? That, that's a great point, and that's one of the main, I think, points in this sort of recasting of the legend of Led Zeppelin. People look back and they say, they only took one song? I mean, come on, in the age of sampling, Every new song takes hundreds of songs, so you're exactly right. The, the technology of sampling has made what Led Zeppelin did kind of an innocent age rampant, and, we, and rappers and everybody else picks and chooses from all the, like, you know, the James Brown drum beats and everything, they're on every piece. So really, I mean, what they did was pretty innocent. And I think that's part of the, what I call the corporate recasting of the legend of Led Zeppelin. Now it's regarded as a strength almost, that they knew the repertoire rather than a weakness in that they were not original. I've got something to, uh, to ask you about. Um, you know, it is true that there's some kind of a machine that takes over after a group is done. And it often happens, too, after a, a performer's death. So we can see both in the case of Elvis and Michael Jackson. You, you guys probably won't remember as much what happened with Elvis, but at the end of Elvis's life, he, he gained a lot of weight, and there were cartoons on the paper that had him like his pants, and he sort of became look kind of foolish. As a, as a sort of 40-something guy trying to look young again. But after the jobs, his, his image was entirely rehabilitated. Same thing with Michael Jackson. At the end of his life, remember all the scandals. There's this Molly Culkin and the Kool-Aid and all the kind of 
clinical trials and all that kind of thing. But then after he died, it's only been a couple years now, all of a sudden his image has been um, rehabilitated. And when, and when, we, when we, were, we think about Michael Jackson, we think about Michael Jackson and AIDS of the thrillers. And when we think about uh, Elvis, we think about Elvis of 1956 and 1957. It's almost like it's easier to rehabilitate artists after they get out of the way. So in other words, it's, 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 even, it's even more extreme example of what you're talking about, which is Led Zeppelin are trying to make the most of this while they're still alive. But some people might say, well, we could really make some money off these guys if they just die and get out of the way and quit wrecking the image so we can get it back to Led Zeppelin 1971. Every time Robert Plant shows up with Alice and Krauss and he looks, you know, every bit of 65 or 70 years old, it, it makes it seem like you know, well, it makes it harder to, to, to fix that image of him as the golden god back in 1971. So. Well, I mean, Kurt Cobain is really the poster boy for that. Everybody said, you know, his dying was a good career move, basically. I mean, he went out, you know, at the right time, and so the band is a legendary band. I mean, Jimi Hendrix, same thing. Janis Joplin, a lot of people died young. So there is the problem that people want to re rehabilitate the band. They see these old guys walking around and say, wait a minute, we want you to look like you did when you were in your 20s, so we don't want this old band. But that's a good point. Uh, cor the corporate recasting of bands really depends on an image. And the image they usually present is the band as a young band, when they're young and hungry and their hits are coming out, not when they're sort of old and fat and, you know, living off the land, so to speak. So it's tough when they're still around. But um, I think in Led Zeppelin's case, uh, the, the recasting I'm trying to talk about a little bit today is not so much the image, it's really the music. I mean, the music was reviled for a long time, and now, now in looking back, we recognize it for the stylistically diverse, musically excellent uh, products that they actually put out. And they're a different kind of band than people thought of in the 70s when they had all these excesses and long, you know, really long concerts. They're really a studio band in my mind. So when they did the covers like Willie Dixon and the other blues artists, were the Mozart's already uh, dead, but were they were cast away by then, or they covered them, covered their music while they're still alive? I'm not quite sure I got that question. So like with Willie Dixon, for example, did Willie Dixon already pass away when, before they covered him? Or? No, in fact, Willie Dixon was alive, and Willie Dixon's daughter played a whole lot of love for him, and she said, you got to hear this. He said, those are my lyrics, and he actually sued Led Zeppelin, and it was settled out of court. So some musicians have died, like Robert Johnson, of course. But uh, musicians like Muddy Waters and Willie Dixon were still around in, in early Led Zeppelin, and, and they sued. Jake Holmes, the guy that wrote Dazed and Confused, he sort of, he, said, he just kind of said, oh, they can have that song, although they were making millions off it when he really wrote it. So a lot of these guys were still alive. A lot of these musicians were still alive while Led Zeppelin was playing their music. Any other questions or comments? Well, if not, let's thank Dave. Dave, have one more time.